This is Mark Strassman, reporter with Utopia Medical News. We're about to speak to Dr. Charles S. Grobe, MD, who is a professor of psychiatry and pediatrics at the UCLA School of Medicine and director of the Division of Child and Adolescent Psychiatry at Harbor UCLA Medical Center. Welcome, Dr. Grobe. Hello. Um, we're going to talk about the therapeutic uh, effects of psilocybin. Uh, tell us about the study that you've recently been involved with, what your role in that study was. Sure. Well, currently we have underway at Harbor UCLA Medical Center a, a, an approved uh, research study where we're looking at the use of psilocybin in the treatment of the anxiety associated with advanced stage cancer. Essentially, we're treating individuals with uh, metastatic stage 4 cancer who have significant uh, existential anxiety and the treatment is directed at the the anxiety specifically not not the cancer itself right uh, what is existential anxiety well it's it's the anxiety that that is uh, intrinsic to the human condition at some point all all of us address the issue that uh, our, our lives ha are, are finite, that inevitably they come to an end, and certainly individuals with uh, diagnoses of end-stage medical disease are forced to grapple with this issue uh, at, at, at that time if they haven't done so earlier in their well, lives. What's the standard of care outside of psilocybin or, or other psychedelic drugs for the treatment of existential anxiety in, in terminally ill people? Well, um, when individuals have anxiety to such a degree that it um, impacts on their on their day-to-day -day function, um, Interventions can include uh, psychotherapy uh, of various sorts. It could also include psychopharmacologic uh, uh, medication, uh, specifically uh, anxiolytics, particularly uh, benzodiazepines, perhaps SSRI, antidepressants. Uh, our model is a very unique model uh, in many respects, uh, and, 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 and it involves a, a particular treatment model within which uh, psilocybin is administered. Talk about that, that the structure of the treatment model that you're working with. Right, right. You know, uh, unlike conventional psychopharmacologic uh, regimens where medications are administered uh, to individuals on a daily basis, sometimes for weeks, months, even years, the, um, the psilocybin treatment model might call for only one time only utilization of psilocybin within the context of an on, let's say, an ongoing psychotherapy. Um, individuals who apply to become part of our research study are provided after we screen them for entry into the study uh, they receive an, a, a, you know a, a number a opportunity to meet with us a number of occasions uh, where we prepare them for the experience we also get to know them we establish rapport but we work with them on their developing an attention, what they hope to get out of the study, and uh, really to give them a sense of what the range of experience might be. Then the actual treatment session itself is on our clinical research unit at Harbor UCLA. We take a uh, one of the, the hospital rooms in that unit, and we fix it up with uh, fabrics and wall hangings, and so it really doesn't look very much like a hospital room. Um, the treatment itself lasts six hours. Uh, I'm with the subject the entire time, as is my co-investigator and my research coordinator. Um, we administer the uh, the compound. We, we let, urge. You know, let, let's talk a little bit about where that. Okay. Well, go go through the procedure, sure, then we'll get back to some of the sure. details. Well, we administer the compound, and then we encourage the subject to lie on the bed and put an eye shade on and put headphones on connected to a CD player where we have pre-selected music and we urge them to go as deeply into the experience as they can. Every hour we check in with them and check their blood pressure and talk with them briefly, see how they're doing, but then we urge them to go back deeply into the experience. Now are they on, the, on their own in the experience? Are they guided? Are you sitting there uh, co coaching them or are they just, just uh, experiencing it by themselves? Well, we're, we're sitting there. We're available as needed, but there, there, there's no guided exercise per se. We, right. we just urge them to go deeply into the experience. Around the, the five-hour point, uh, they, they're starting to come down, then, then they sit up and 
we, we start to process what their experiences during the session might have been. And then I'll, I'll also mention that in uh, following the session, there's, again, ample opportunity for subjects to talk with us to, to help uh, process and integrate the experience they had. I'll also mention subjects come into the clinical research unit on two separate occasions, space a month apart. On one occasion they receive the active medicine psilocybin, on the other occasion they receive a placebo. So every subject functions as their own control. Do they, they don't know which no, one? No, it's all okay. double blind. Okay. Uh, I want to talk about, oh go ahead. And we don't know either. Okay. We can usually figure it out. Right. Um, uh, talk about the back, your background, and how you came to be a psychedelic researcher. Well, um, I mean, I've been aware for some time with the history of psychiatric uh, research with hallucinogens, and uh, really became um, very uh, impressed with the literature going back some 35 years. Say a little bit about that, the origins of psychedelic uh, psychiatric research, and, and what was found when, right. by whom. Well, actually, when hallucinogens were actively studied by psychiatry in the 1950s, 1960s, up to the very early 1970s. It was really one of the most exciting areas of psychiatric research. Uh, uh, there, there was uh, actually at that time tremendous enthusiasm about, about what might be learned uh, from, from, from psychedelics, from hallucinogens. and. Um, uh, and much was learned, both in our understanding how the how the brain operates. Uh, most people are not aware of this, but much of what uh, you know, much of the foundation of uh, our knowledge of the of neurotransmitter systems, particularly the serotonin neurotransmitter system, came from early laboratory studies with LSD. So maybe this is a good point to talk about the relationship between LSD, psilocybin, and related compounds, and. Uh, Prozac, Soloft, and uh, its uh, okay, well, other SSRIs, right. and what was learned then and what's the significance right. of that? Well, I mean, you know, where the serotonin system was in the brain was identified through laboratory studies of LSD, where LSD was labeled with a radioactive isotope and it was injected into the animals, then x-rays were taken, and where in the brain uh, was lighting up was where the, it turned out to be where the serotonin receptors were. Now subsequently uh, the serotonergic system has been one of the most active areas of psychiatric research up to the present day and many of the standard medications we utilize both for the treatment of depression, anxiety, and also psychotic illness oper have a strong uh, focus of their action is on the serotonin system, including the SSRI antidepressants like Prozac, Alexa, Lexapro, and Zoloft, uh, as well as uh, some of the atypical neuroleptic antipsychotic medications. So in fact, the entire anti yeah. in, in fact, the entire antidepressant revolution is really an offshoot of the psychedelic research of the 60s, 50s and 60s, isn't well, it? One could make the case. Okay. In fact, I have made the case. Right. Okay. And, they, and, and I think this is an area to, to, to appreciate, that there was much that was learned, and of course the origins of it coming from research in the lab with uh, hallucinogenic compounds has been forgotten, but that, what, that, that is the historical record. What can you say about the common elements and the differences between the, eff the effects on uh, the brain of LSD, psilocybin, and uh, Zoloft and, and, well, and uh, related compounds? Well, that, that's an area where there needs to be more research, uh, particularly understanding how hallucinogens have their, uh, you know, ha how they have their impact. We know that the hallucinogens affect sub-receptors of uh, serotonin, particularly the 5-HT2A uh, and 2C receptors. Um, uh, the uh, SSRIs uh, affect, uh, impede reuptake of serotonin that's available. Um, and we, there's a pretty clear understanding of the, how that, that mechanism functions. How, how hallucinogens function is still really could be, should be one of the more exciting areas of neuroscience and psychiatric research. And I think knowledge is being accrued, but we, I don't believe we have the definitive answer. Is it gen in general terms a, a blocking of the a reuptake of the, of the serotonin in the same way that the SSRIs uh, were? It seems to be different. Okay. It's a different kind of effect. All right. Uh, talk about the administrative hurdles that you uh, had to undergo in order to do the psilocybin test. Well, there are a number of hurdles we had to get over to conduct this study. We had to go through the uh, 
the federal regulatory agencies, the, the, a, a state regulatory body, as well as our own in-house hospital committees. So we went through the, the FDA, the DEA, the California Research Advisory Panel, which is based in San Francisco, and then at our hospital, Harbor UCLA, we had to go through the uh, Institutional Review Board, the IRB, or the Human Subjects Research Committee, as well as the uh, Research Center Committee, because we're doing the study on the in our general clinical research center. What was the argument you made in favor of doing this study, and what were the counter arguments that were posed by people who didn't want you to do it? Well, if there were any uh, such I, I wouldn't say I ran into anyone who didn't want us to do it. I ran into a number of critiques of our study. What, what were the what were the critiques? Well, and how I, did you answer instance, their, their? Yeah, for instance, no. Look, and I'll have to say right off the bat that I thought that uh, every regulatory agency and committee we had to work with, people were very reasonable and gave us very good input. So an example of how we had to modify our study was uh, we initially applied to the FDA for permission to work with psilocybin at zero point three milligrams per kilogram, which we thought would be a very good clinical dose. Uh, their response was they felt that uh, given that this, uh, that psilocybin had not been researched in this population in many years, uh, or a clinical population in many years, and, um, uh, and that these were very medically ill individuals, they advised that we start at a lower dose. So we agreed to uh, we kind of agreed on a, on a m more moderate dose, which is 0 0.2 milligram per kilogram psilocybin, and uh, so 0 0.2 milligram psilocybin per kilogram body weight of the subject. So one third less than you wanted to do. Right, right, right. So again, it's it's not as strong a dose as we initially would have liked, but I thought their input was certainly reasonable, given that these were quite ill people, and we needed to accrue some some data on effects of a more moderate dose before perhaps utilizing a higher dose. So my hope is uh, that once we complete what we're approved for at this dose, we will resubmit a second proposal asking to, to, to administer a somewhat higher dose. Uh, what was the source of the psilocybin? Did you grow mushrooms in the basement oh, no. or did you get uh, chemicals from a lab? How did right, that work? Right, right. No, this is not this is, this is, you know, although psilocybin is the active alkaloid in hallucinogenic mushrooms, psilocybin we use is not extracted from mushrooms. Rather, it is a pure laboratory synthesis uh, uh, conducted in a um, laboratory in Massachusetts that's under contract with the government to make Schedule One drugs for research. Okay. Um, and uh, how many uh, patients were involved in the study? Well, we're, and what was the timing? Okay. From, when, when did you get the idea and how long did it take you until you started the oh, study? Well, I got the idea over 30 years ago. Okay. okay. <laughs> I, 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 I guess I, well, it's a bit of a complicated story. Back in the 90s, the early 90s, I did some uh, re clinical research with the drug MDMA. And initially I had submitted a protocol to work with uh, cancer patients. It was not accepted because there was no normal volunteer data. I was approved to do a normal volunteer study, but in, subsequent to that, the issue of MDMA or ecstasy had become highly sensationalized. I was also concerned about some of the, the, the range of physiologic effect, particularly on the cardiovascular system. And given that these were very ill people to begin with, I was concerned about their vulnerability. Uh, also, the issue had become so sensationalized. So uh, after cons consultation with some colleagues, I decided to change my protocol from MDMA to psilocybin. So, so that the MDA, uh, MDMA study was never done? Not with cancer patients, no. Was it done with normal patients? Yes, I did a normal volunteer study in the early 90s. But your plan was to go on to cancer patients, but because of the sensationalization, you weren't right. able to do right. that. That's one reason, because ecstasy had become so sensationalized, because use had become so rampant among young people. But the other issue was observing the responses of my um, um, uh, normal volunteer research subjects with MDMA. We had uh, two subjects who had significant hypertensive reactions, and uh, I, I was concerned, again, because uh, subjects for the cancer study would, by definition, have severe medical illness, and I thought they, th this drug might be a little too powerful, a little have too much of a some pathomimetic impact, so therefore I felt psilocybin would have a milder physiologic effect, a milder effect on cardiovascular function. It was also far less sensationalized, and so that's uh, what we decided to do. Now our study has been up and running for more than two years. Recruitment has been slow. We have studied 
uh, in entirety so far six subjects. We're approved for a total of 12, so we're looking to study six more. We have two other subjects that we've screened and who are scheduled to be treated uh, next month, so we are, we are starting to pick up uh, steam and move forward a little bit more quickly. So in fact, th this psilocybin experiment is a continuation of your earlier MDMA experiment. It, the, it's the cancer patient part, and y you, ha you didn't do any experiments on normal no. people with psilocybin. No, it, no, we did not, although I'd say from the research record of the 50s and 60s, there was sufficient uh, normal, vo normal uh, research subject data that uh, I imagine that agent, regulatory agencies thought it was reasonable for us to move forward with a patient population. And again, the dose that you used here was either a placebo or 0.2 uh, milligrams per kilogram of body weight? Yes, correct. Okay. Um, and you've had six experimental subjects. Yes, yes. Uh, tell us the, res the results. Well, um, you know, we, we give them many um, questionnaires to fill out, both before, right after, and then for six months afterwards. However, we, we have not analyzed any of those instruments and will not until we complete all 12 of our research subjects. Uh, but I can describe my observations Please. and the observations of my staff, uh, which is that all, and what our subjects have told us, uh, they, they, they all tell us they found the experience to be quite valuable with uh, several in particular, our, at least our observations are, we'll have to see if the instruments we use bear this out, but our observation so far is that they have significantly less anxiety, improved mood, overall improved quality of life um, in the, uh, for weeks, even months afterwards. Uh, a couple in particular, a couple of our subjects in particular have, have uh, had very, uh, provided very positive verbal um, kind of feedback and told us how much this uh, th th this treatment has meant for them for their lives.